I was, so when I read your response, I really resonated with your image of the overflowing cup as a reminder mm -hmm. to shift perspective, um, to feel the constant flow of divine presence. And I was wondering, do you have techniques that you use with seriously ill congregants to help them similarly shift their perspective? Uh, yes, I think that oftentimes that's, it's not the only language I use, but sometimes that's the, the, the language that I'll use. Uh, and actually, I was uh, just as we happened today to get the, um, the full Shema journal that will, you know, this piece will be in, uh, I was really taken by Sharon Salzberg's article, which uh, very much resonates with this same theme. I mean, she's coming from a Buddhist perspective, and I've really found um, those perspectives, that, that vocabulary, to be enormously helpful. I'm often trying to find sort of the Jewish language to convey similar ideas, that, that oftentimes the reality that we're faced with is the reality that we're faced with. And so um, while we all need to have um, time to recognize, sometimes to mourn what we've lost uh, and uh, to mourn what we cannot you know, get back, uh, the ongoing nature of suffering is often to do with you know, where, we, where we direct our mind's energy. And so trying to use similar language to that which you would find in Buddhist practice that, that Sharon was mentioning, that, that life does have suffering, and how do we live in the face of that? I think a lot of that is to do with perspective. As, uh, as another of uh, those great teachers says, Sylvia Borstein, if it could be different, it would be different. And sort of beginning there and acknowledging, but then trying to find other ways of being sustained uh, particularly emotionally and spiritually, in spite of whatever we're facing, uh, is often the direction that I'm trying to take congregants uh, as, as we travel together through whatever it is that they're going through. So would an example of, of what you're talking about, say, be looking at the, looking at the morning blessings that you say upon awake, awakening? A lot of those are they're very basic. So you could be seriously ill and those blessings could still bring you to a sense of gratitude in the moment is it, so is that would that be an example of cultivating a buddhist perspective of of being in the moment and kind of recognizing where where you are in a way that that shifts perspective it's funny i wouldn't necessarily go there as an example in fact i was just struck uh, this past shabbat uh, having a um, a cell phone sort of sitting on top of the bima on so that a very um, uh, ill grandparent was able to at least listen in on their uh, grandson's uh, bar mitzvah that, you know, as we were saying those morning blessings and I stopped to say something to the congregation about how every morning uh, in our prayer services we have this op opportunity to give thanks for the most basic thing, the fact that we're able to be present here. And on the one hand, you know, that grandparent had the blessing of being able to hear. And on the other hand, I'm not sure that that person was in a place to be able to take in the blessing of that, mm -hmm. given the sadness of not being able to be physically present in the room to, to watch their grandson. So I, I'm not sure whether that's a place pastorally um, I would go. I, I think w where I was coming from with my the, what I had put in the journal is it's sometimes actually getting away from the specifics of um, blessing and specifically sort of thinking about God's role in that and actually thinking more about what is the experience that we can tap into. So for example in that Psalm 23 when we talk about you know the eternal one is my shepherd is you know, sometimes people really can tap into the sense that you know I'm being held you know I'm being carried through this and that can be very spiritually powerful but some people can't get there as an abstract sort of uh, sense of there being a greater spirit a greater power but they can get, get there if you talk about um, friends and family and people who are there for them being the expression of a divine spirit that is reaching out to them 
Uh, and so sometimes I try and use that language, much more humanistic language, uh, to help people tap into an experience that they can really have that doesn't require them to make an enormous theological leap that, depending on who they are and what their personal theology is, they may or not be able to easily make. So that friends and family bring the face of God to that patient, whether you would explicitly name it as that, but that's somewhat what you're thinking about. Right. They, can, they can be the shepherds. And that's when you're dealing with somebody who themselves is incapacitated. But I was also thinking in terms of this as healing liturgy, you know, sometimes we're dealing with people where they're not bedridden, they're not incapacitated, but they're in a lot of pain. And it might be spirit, it might be emotional suffering, it might be psychological. And sometimes recognizing that one of the ways to experience what is potentially sustaining in that cup that overflowing cup isn't always what you receive by somebody else pouring something into your vessel but actually you receive the bountifulness of the cup when you reach out and actually sort of get beyond yourself and are uh, reaching out to make a difference to somebody else that you see is in need you know that sometimes if you're in a physical position where you can do that 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 can be enormously healing um, and sort of bring you out of yourself. And we all know that oftentimes when we go to reach out to help somebody else, um, that often we're the ones that receive the gift. Yeah, uh, I, and so I wanted that to be a sort of a, a mutual, it can go either way. It's not always sitting there waiting to see who's going to come refill your cup. Your cup can be refilled by you being the one to be the first one to reach out your hand to somebody else. Right. I, you know, I see that in the hospital sometimes where, you know, there'll be, uh, one of my units is a unit where most of the patients are receiving chemotherapy, and another one of the units is a unit where most of the patients are receiving a blood or marrow transplant. And um, so there are times when patients either physically can't leave their room or uh, because of strength or they can't because of their, they're so immune compromised. But when they can, even if then after that they're feeling quite ill, I'll notice sometimes that if I say to them, if they say they want to pray, I always ask, what do you want to pray for today? And the days for those patients who are, who say, I want to pray for other people on the unit or other people in the hospital, I notice that they bring a different quality to the prayer and that they that there is there is a strength that they're drawing exactly by stepping outside of themselves to right. ask to pray in that way there's something else that you said when you were talking about how you're not really looking at the specifics of blessing or or even maybe even necessarily the specifics of the imagery so much and i never thought of this before but i think that psalm 23 is so iconic that for some patients, it's not, it's not just a prayer. The saying of it is a ritual. And so, mm -hmm. so that there are ways in which just by, by saying it, even if they're not going into the specifics of it, they receive the comfort of it in a, in a gestalt overall way. I think that's certainly true for some people. I mean, I think that everybody's relationship to uh, to these uh, traditional materials is is different. For some, uh, you know, if you're bringing it and they're listening to those words and they're sort of uh, engaging in a very rationalist sense, you know, as we were called upon to comment on these specific lines, there are lines that, you know, depending on where you're at, you can get stuck. Um, but if you are familiar with it as being a psalm that is recited as a psalm of comfort, then you receive it as we're, gi we're providing comfort, we're giving comfort, and that's, uh, that's pr primarily the experience that you're going to have if that's your primary association. I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. I had another question related to some of these things that we're talking about, and I I'm, I'm always grappling with this, with the balance of uh, you know, a lot of what I do with patients is if they are in the valley of the shadow of death, I sit there with them, you know, or I walk through it with them. I'm not trying to get them out of it, um, mm -hmm. you know, in any kind of directed way. And yet, at the same time, um, there are times when it can be helpful to model a shift of perspective, kind of like what you were referring to. So how do you do that dance? How do you strike that balance between 
really sitting with a congregant or a patient exactly where they are and and when do you um, you know offer something that's a slightly different perspective do you do you have uh, guidelines for yourself that you've developed I, I'd like to think that I have an ability to pick up on cues um, as opposed to specific guidelines uh, and and it's a learning process it's it's certainly there are times when all of us even you know people with a great deal more experience uh, in chaplaincy type work than certainly I have uh, there, there will be times when you go oh did I miss the cue you know did I did I pick up on that quite right I mean I I think that generally my pastoral approach is to to do to do a lot of listening uh, and sometimes somebody simply feels supported by having an opportunity to express where they're where they are that, that would be my you know always where I begin uh, but you're right there are times sometimes where if I hear a any kind of expression of wish I wish I didn't feel this way I wish I could do more of this I you know, I wish I could see that there was something around the corner. Anything that expresses in a, that language or in different language some kind of wish, I that's often a cue where I'll say, "Well, so is that?" And that's where I might come from. You know, I can't. I don't want to make false promises about what may be tomorrow, but we can mm -hmm. certainly talk about whether a shift of perspective or whether something specific to hold on to can at least provide a little bit more um, energy for that hope. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that would probably be the place where I would look for a cue. I, I can think of a, a congregant that I, I know who has been in uh, hospice uh, care for quite a while now and, uh, and, and has very little energy um, and, and it really has brought them down. But we've sometimes been able to talk about making a plan to try and do one thing that they enjoy. They enjoy cooking. They don't have the energy to cook and to make their own meals every day. But perhaps they can plan to try and make one thing this week um, and share it with someone. Uh, those, those kinds of cues. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, um, the thing that patients tell me most often about how they cope with being in the hospital is... They'll, they'll start by saying, I take one day at a time, and then they'll, they'll correct themselves. And this happens over and over, and they'll say, no, no, that's too, that's, too big a, that's too big a chunk. You know, I take things an hour at a time or a minute at a time. And I think that in that context that there can be those moments maybe when they're, they're open to a shift of perspective and moments when they're not. I, 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 you know, and in that way, to come back around to what you, where we started, they... Um, they become kind of intuitively in that Buddhist place of being with themselves from moment to moment, always in the present. Right. Right. And I think that that is something, again, coming back to that concept of if this idea of this cup, you know, contains some kind of spiritual sustenance, uh, it, the, the, it, being able to tune into that, being aware of it, which I described as sort of you know taking a step to the left or right and sort of getting back under the flow of the shower head, um, that that moment to moment uh, awareness, consciousness, or mindfulness is what can sometimes help you to get there. Because right this moment, I might be feeling incredibly low, uh, or I might be experiencing pain, um, but you know the following hour there may be an awareness of relief or someone walks into the room and smiles and you know you have a momentary exchange with uh, a nurse and and you laugh together and being present to that you know you're back under the shower head even if it's just for a moment uh, and sometimes those are the things that you know we grasp onto uh, to help us through right. yeah that's a great that's a great way of, of making that very vivid and real well, thank you, Rachel. It's been great to talk with you. Yeah, very much so. It's uh, this is an interesting way of extending the uh, the, the the project, and uh, I'm glad to have had the opportunity.